Merci beaucoup. Bonsoir. Um, uh, well, again, uh, I speak a bit of French, but not enough to have a conversation. But I promised myself that one day I'll be able to come to France and give a talk in French with a very weird accent, but, well, at least it's French, right? So sorry for not s speaking that. Uh, I studied one year of, of French when I wasn't uh, at college, so it has been some years. And I didn't speak uh, after that, so I didn't have the chance to press. But I can survive here in France, like the restaurants, ha asking for directions, yeah, maybe the weather, so, yeah. merci. Yeah. And uh, today we're going to talk about revisiting Affected Java in 2019. Uh, Joshua Block um, released the third edition of the, the book, uh, one year and something, December 2017. So uh, a bit more than one year. How many of you have read uh, any edition of Affected Java? The third edition? Okay, uh, a couple. So, uh, so we'll be covering what's new, some, some of the stuff that I believe it's interesting, and if you want to know more about me, uh, my Twitter handle is at Yanaga, I'm a Brazilian Japanese, and I'm fluent only in English and Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese, but I can try, I have travel French, travel Spanish, no, Spanish I can speak, travel French, travel Italian, and travel Japanese, so enough to survive in some places in the world. I also happen to be a, a Java champion and a Microsoft MVP, which as far as Google can tell, I'm the first and only so far. And if you have your mobile phones ready, uh, I brought some swag for you to, tonight. So uh, here, here's the deal. So I have brought uh, six t-shirts, which is a very nice opportunity because this is the last meeting we're going to have at this Red Hat office because it's going to be closed. So then we're moving to the new one. And these are the very last ones of these t-shirts from the Code is My Spirit Animal uh, stamp. So uh, you have the opportunity to get the, grab the very few last ones. So I brought six t-shirts. And for the great prize, I have a Chromebook. It's a very nice Chromebook that works as a tablet too. So it's a yoga one, so it can work works as a tablet. I chose this one myself. It's a $400 Chromebook, so it must be worth something. And if you don't like Chromebooks, well, you can sell it. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Just don't tell anybody from here, okay? So that's what we have for the raffle. And the rules are, if you don't have a Twitter account, today is a very nice opportunity to create a Twitter account. So I advise you to take a picture of the rules. So you have to follow me on Twitter, at Yanaga. You need to take a picture of the session. Uh, you need to mention at Yanaga on the tweet, and you need to put the hashtag Paris Jug. And if you say nice things about me, it's a bonus, okay? The application recognizes that. You have more chances. So these are the rules for you to be able to earn the T-shirts or the Chromebook. So three seconds for you to take a picture. You can take other pictures too. But this one I recommend you because these are the rules for the raffle. And at the end of the night, we're going to um, have the, uh, the raffle. And of course, uh, during the break, we'll have some pizza. I hope you're hungry because we ordered a lot of pizza. And it should be uh, enough for everybody. And uh, last tip, I uh, released this book two years ago from O'Reilly, Migrate into Microservice Databases, and thanks Red Hat. Uh, developer for buying the royalties of the electronic version. So if you go to this URL, you'll be able to get uh, an, a PDF or an EPUB version of the book. Or if you go to my Twitter profile, the first pinned tweet has a link to the, my book too. Okay? And I'm also writing another book about event-driven architecture, which uh, they asked me to finish it by fall, which is October-ish is the expected date, but as I told them, I'm a software developer, I'm very bad on estimates, so don't trust me on the October dates. So, but, but it's a goal, okay? And I was also writing another book about domain-driven design, 
but I stopped the work. Uh, I just worked, will work, uh, wrote one chapter because I switched it, uh, work to work on the event-driven architecture um, uh, book. So that's what we can expect. So to the, tonight, we're going to talk about the third edition of the book. And it's very interesting to see that's how some good concepts they are spread and usually they are talked by uh, many different authors. For example, another book that has many things in concept is Domain Driven Design from um, uh, Eric Evans. So this book also has like 10, 12 years uh, 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 of age and uh, I think it's still current. It's a very hard read, but just like Affected Java, I think it's for more uh, senior people. In fact, I would say that Affected Java Clean code, domain driven design, refactoring to patterns, and refactoring were some of the books that changed my mindset. And maybe if you're able to learn and apply the concepts that are available in the book, you can consider yourself uh, for being promoted from a regular developer to a senior developer, because I truly believe that senior Java developers uh, should be able to master the, the concepts that are available in this book. So it's a very recommended read. If you buy one of these, this is not one of the books you're going to sell later. You're going to be reading and rereading these books uh, over your entire career. Because even if we've affected Java, I have like uh, the, three, the three editions. And even then, I keep reading and rereading every time I need to. Oh, maybe I should be applying these concepts. I need to reread how and why I should be using that. So I just open the book and read again. So what is new on the third edition? The third edition has some uh, topics covering lambdas, streams, optionals, default methods and interfaces, dry web resources, and also we'll try to cover tonight some of my favorite uh, sessions of the book, which are factored methods, uh, equals, hash codes to string and comparable, and also minimize mutability and enums. And if you're wondering what are these numbers, uh, the, the book is divided in sections. Each section covers uh, one different topic, and it's ordered. So if you go to the number, uh, it's the number of the section on the book, too. Okay. So, but enough for talking. Let's try to see some code. And if you want to see a longer version of this talk, uh, I always do live coding, so the session is always different. But one version of the session, which is three hours long, is available on the um, DevOx YouTube channel, which I presented last year. And I have other versions on YouTube too, so I always try to switch some of the concepts. Some new, some different, but uh, if you just Google my name, you'll be able to find some uh, interesting versions, okay? So let's try to mirror my screen first. Right. And know some people here will be upset because I'm not using Eclipse Che, but they, well, uh, I promise I'll try this year. So next demos, maybe the next demo I'll be using VS Code, but on this demo I'm still using uh, effect, uh, IntelliJ because I'm just used to this. So I also type faster when I'm using IntelliJ for now. So let's try to add some concepts. I'm going to create a new Java class. Uh, let's do a phone number. Okay. So if I want to do, is it big enough for you? At least you can see on the TV on the side too. Yeah. So let's see. So let's try to uh, minimize mutability and how can we create that if you want to create an uh, immutable class. So, and why should be immutable? You should be reading the book, but uh, immutable classes are very good as value objects if you uh, use to domain driven design terminology. So we try to we should try to minimize mutability as much as possible. And and why is that? Most of the bugs that are really hard to solve into productions are, are the one caused by inconsistent states, which means that our object has too much mutability. So uh, we have many methods, different methods that can change the code. So we have a very uh, big surface to cover. So it's very often so, oh, we have many different codes scattered through our application that can change the state of the object. And sometimes these objects leads to an inconsistent state, and this is consistent state leads to bugs. And the problem with that is you never know which piece of, the, of your application code changes the state of your object. 
So if you, want to, if you want to try to avoid this kind of bugs, we need to minimize the mutability of our, our objects. I have another session on YouTube where I, where I describe how can you do that using entities. But for simple classes like, for example, phone number, you can make it truly 100% immutable. So that's what we're going to do right now. So if I want to make it immutable, maybe I should be trying to declare like an area code as a final and also uh, uh, the number uh, also as a final. If I want to, uh, of course, it's complaining because I need to provide a constructor. And I don't like constructors, so I'm going to provide the first refactoring. I'm going to refactor this constructor to a factor method. And you can give many different names for, for this uh, factor methods. One of my favorite is off, but if you know that you're always creating a new instance when you're calling the factor method, you should be calling your method for something like new instance. Uh, on the JDK, you can find some uh, value off. It really depends on your taste, but I, I, I'm the one that prefers off. But of course, you can choose the name that you want. And that's one of the first advantages of using factor methods. We, you can give a name to factor methods. So you can give more meaning to a factor method. Also, when you're using a factor method, you don't have to create a new object every time you're calling the factor method. For example, uh, suppose that for a phone number, we had a very complex calculation or we had to access some kind of service, external service, which made like the creation of objects very expensive. So instead of creating a new instance of phone number every time the factor method was called, Maybe we should be caching the instance that we already created. And whenever you pass the same values to the arguments, we always return in the same instance, which is an implementation of the, of the flyweight design pattern. If you implement the flyweight design pattern, you have another advantage is that when you're comparing instances of phone number, you don't need to use the equals method. You can use the equality operator because you're always returning the same instance. That's another advantage if you're thinking about performance, for example. Okay. And the last advantage of using factor methods is that you are not required to return always the same type of object when you have a factor method. Okay. So for now, we, uh, if you have a constructor, uh, when you say new phone number, you, you always need to know before you create the object, which is the type of the object that you want to create, which leads to a very kind of... Uh, uh, hard constructing in the Java language because if you want to refactor uh, later phone number to a uh, hierarchy or to an interface, you need to go through the source code and change everywhere where new phone number is being called. But if you use a factor method and later you want to refactor phone number to an interface or you want to provide more instances of phone number, it's very easy to change that because the only place in your code that, uh, that where you can create phone numbers is this method. So if you change here, no, uh, nowhere else in your code you have to change um, uh, for a different type of implementation. For example, suppose that if area code were greater than a thousand, you would be returning a new international phone number. And this class doesn't even need to be public. It could be package private. It could be an internal private class. Uh, as long as it is a, f a child of phone number, your code would never break. So that's one, one, of, one, one of the ways where you can increment and refactor your code. You can add new behavior to your application without changing anywhere else uh, if you constrain the creation of objects to your factor methods, right? So this is a very yeah, nice uh, application of factor methods. And that's why factor methods is one of my favorite constructs in Java. Another uh, thing that you should be doing if you're cr using factor methods is that you should be always checking the values, the state of your objects when you create the objects and not where you're using them later. So it's very common for you to, when you're using Java, for example, you create um, POJOs and you have getters and setters for everything. You just let your business classes populate the objects and later you need to uh, apply some sort of validator to the, to the, to the state of the object to confirm if the, uh, if the state is consistent or not. I think it's much better for you to check here on the factor method or constructor or builder layer, which is another case. For example, if you can't have area negative or zero uh, area codes, you should be checking here. So maybe I should be checking here arguments, area code needs to be greater than zero. And if you're wondering where this, does this method come from, 
check argument is from the Guava library. Some people hate me for using Guava. Some people don't complain. But that's true. Uh, Guava in the past had very serious uh, backward compatibility issues. They promised that from Guava 29 and forward, they wouldn't be breaking the backward compatibility. But to be honest, I haven't been using Guava in production in the past two years at least, so I don't know if it's really uh, being fulfilled. But if you have any feedback, you'll be able to uh, give this feedback to me. But it wouldn't be hard for you to even provide your implementation. You could be go here, for example. Uh, this method just, though, if not expression, throw new illegal argument exception, which is the right exception if you have an illegal argument in your method. Okay? So it's a very simple implementation. You could be using and creating your own uh, utility class for that too. And now that you have a static uh, import in Java, it's even cleaner uh, for your uh, syntax. So check argument, maybe check number. Oops. Check argument, maybe a number should be greater than 1,000. So these are some of the checks for you to have a consistent state. So this is what I wanted to say about factory methods. And if you're creating an immutable object, and if it's supposed to be a value object, uh, you should be also be implementing some basic methods from the Java language, for example, equals and hash code. And a, a nice implementation of equals could be if it's an instance of phone number, maybe I should phone number other re receives an object. And I can return objects dot equals this dot error code other dot. And okay. Objects was a class available on uh, Guava. But since Java 7, uh, the JDK team imported some utility methods from the Guava library. So now you don't need to uh, import the Guava libraries anymore, for example, for using this kind of comparison, which is a very nice thing. If you have a JDK alternative for that, maybe it's better for you, for you to use the JDK. If you don't, maybe you, you can use some other types of resources. Okay, And here, you should be returning false. If you don't care about performance, this is a very nice way for you to implement the equals method. The problem with equals here is that we know that if, you, if the properties of your objects are uh, object references too, this is, a, this is a very efficient implementation. But since we know that area code and number are primitive, this is a very um, expensive operation. Because every time we're using here, you can see the arguments are objects. So we're doing boxing and unboxing, which is a very expensive operation in the Java language. So if you know that your uh, properties are primitives, maybe you should be doing this. OK, because the, the advantage of using objects.equals is that it compares if this is no or the other is no. So it's a no safe operation. Okay, So you should be refactoring to using the primitive, uh, 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 using the quality operator if you know that they are primitive. And if you want another uh, performance improvement, a very cheap one indeed, you could say that if object equals to this, return true. So if you know that your object is going to be extensively used in collections, for example, and you, you're constantly comparing for equality, maybe object equals to this return true is a very cheap uh, operation. It's a, just a one-liner and greatly improves your performance, especially if you have too many properties inside your object because, well, it's a reflexive operation. You should always be equal to yourself. And if you want to implement hash codes, again, if you don't care about performance, one of the alternatives is that you could be using this dot area code, this dot number. Yeah? You should always be hashing on the same order that you're comparing the properties on the equals method. So this is one of the contracts that you should be having uh, in your object. So equals and hash code. These are some of the operations. If you want to code this hash code by yourself, if you go to the book, uh, Joshua Block suggests a very efficient implementation of hash code that you can implement by yourself. Or if you're using a library or in an IDE, of course, you can ask your library IDE to automatically generate uh, the equals and hash code for you. One of the disadvantages of using IDEs for generating this kind of code is that it's not unusual for developers to, oh, maybe I'll change the order of my property here, or maybe I'll add another property, and then they uh, forget to delete the code and, and 
regenerate the equals and hash code again, which leads to bugs in your production. So uh, some people are, say that it's better for you to lose a library. We have some, you have, uh, we have uh, some open source libraries, for example, Immutables or Auto, that generate equals and hash code for you that are layers that are prone. I don't have a particular taste. You can even use uh, Lombok for doing that. So it depends on if you want a compile time library, if you want uh, which generates the code for you, if you want the IDE. I'm from the time where these libraries didn't work well, so I prefer to generate the code myself. But I admit that it's unproductive. But I keep asking myself also, how much time in my life do I spend in writing equals and hash code? Because usually the objects you write today, you're going to use them for the next five, ten years. So it's not really a waste of time. Uh, you just need to make sure that if, you've, if you're generating this code by yourself, you need to implement the test case to make sure that they are behaving properly. Okay? And if you read the book, you know what are the properties that you need to fulfill when you're, when you're uh, writing this kind of, of uh, methods. So another very important method from uh, the Java library, the basic object class, is toString. Some people believe that toString should be used to generate business strings. No, toString is for developers. ToString is important because if you want to debug your object, uh, your object into production, you need to string to be meaningful. So if you want to add the object to a log statement, or if you want to roll over the mouse and to your IDE to know what is the value of the object, to string needs to provide some information for you as a developer. So for example, Guava has a very nice uh, uh, helper for you to be able to create um, developer strings. So if I choose to string helper, then I can say, well, maybe uh, area code could be this and add number oops dot to string okay so what type of string does it print so if I go here and do a phone number of 999,000 so if I do this and let me Scroll here for you if, if I want to run it. I think I'm missing some. You see, phone number, area code equals to 999, number equals to 10,000. This is a very nice string for developers. You know exactly what is the state of your object, and if you have a bug, you know why uh, uh, the bug is happening, or at least, at least you should know why is it happening. And what does it differ from, how does it differ from a business string? If you want to pretty print a business string, you have another method on the JDK, uh, which should be used for you to create business strings, and this interface is formatable. So if you use formatable and you implement format to, this method provides you with internationalization and all the other parameters. You have everything available here on these parameters. So this is the method that you should be using. I'll just provide a very simple implementation here. So say that I want the area code, digits, uh, digits, so area code, and number. So I'm not checking any of the other parameters, flags, width, precision. If you want to learn how to use the formatable interface, I recommend you to read the Java doc. It's a very big Java doc, but if you read everything, you have all the information that you need to print to print your business strings. So how does it differ? So if I want to just use this one, if I use the print F, I can say that, well, I want to provide, and then we can see how they differ. So phone number, the two string methods is providing me the developer string, and the one from the bottom is providing me the business string. Okay, So this is how you should be using. And if you're providing a business string where you clearly separate the area code from the number, which means that if you're, if you're providing the information, the internal information, in a way that the user can clearly distinct the values, then you should also be providing a getter for that. Okay, so you should get a get number, mm, get area code. 
I strongly uh, recommend you to not provide getters for everything, or uh, especially setters. You should be very careful about using that. I usually don't recommend providing getters for everything. You need to think if you need, really need the getters, because most of the times it, it exposes internal information from the object. But on this case, since you're providing a string with the values already separated, if you don't do that, the other developers that are using your class, you can be certain that they will parse the string to get the area code and the number. Which leads to another problem. Every time people are parsing strings to get internal values, they will be, get, they will be broken whenever you change the external representation. Like suppose that somebody decides, that, oh, now we're providing another way. We're not printing this way anymore. Now we have parentheses, or we have a space, or we have something else. Everybody that was parsing this string is broken right now. So if you're providing the values as the strings, which is clearly separated, you should be providing the getters too, because that's the way that other developers should be consuming the internal properties. Okay. So these are some of the things that we can be doing. Another thing is that, well, if we implement equals in hash code, maybe phone numbers could have an order. So if you want to create an order, maybe we should be impl implementing comparable. So if we want to be comparable with phone number, we can provide another method called, for example, compare to. And the old way of implementing compare to would be if you're using pre-Java 8, for example, you should be using comparison chain from Guava. It's one way of comparing, okay, you have, like, you could use the uh, Apache commons. You could be comparing this dot area code, o dot area code, compare this dot number, o dot number, and then getting a result. Okay, uh, up to Java 7, this was one of the best ways for you to be comparing um, your object to other ones. If not, maybe uh, for the Java 8 version, should be, well, maybe I could be using, i uh, just comment out this code. I uh, could, uh, comparator. Comparator now provides some very nice uh, uh, builders for me to create comparators on the fly. So I could be comparing int, and I, if I create, I can create a very nice lambda here. Phone number P, and I can say that I want to compare P dot area codes. Then comparing int P, P dot number, p dot compare, uh, this, oh, okay. So this is the Java 8 version of implementing compare to. You create a comparator, and then you compare first the error code, and then the number, which is, a not, which is not a very efficient way, because every time we're calling this method, we're creating a new instance of a comparator. So maybe we could be refactoring this code. I could be picking up this piece of code, could be refactoring extract constant. So phone number comparator. So I just declare this. Return phone number comparator, compare this, because uh, the, all of the comparators that doesn't even need to be public can be private. Okay, Because all of the comparators created by the Java 8 uh, uh, builder, they are uh, thread safe. So uh, uh, you can use them in a shared state. Okay? So these are some of the comments that I have to make when we're using creating objects, immutable objects, comparators, equals, in the hash code. You should be very careful here, for example, in the hash. If you know that your object is immutable, it's never going to change after you create the object. You could, for, for example, be extracting this uh, in a property. Let's say you could say private hash. And just storing this, every time you create the object, you already store the hash, which is much more efficient than calculating the hash every time, and you know that it doesn't change. Uh, so if you intend to use your object as the key, uh, in a hash set or in, as a key to a hash map, you should be very careful about implementing hash code. And the Java lang the Effective Java o o uh, already recommends for you that if you're using any kind of object as the key to a hash map, uh, you should be using immutable objects, right? Because one very common bug, for, especially for beginners, is that, oh, I added something to a hash set or to a hash map. I, I'm pretty sure I added this object, but I'm now I'm trying to get the key or uh, checking if the object is in the collection, and it's always returning false or it's returning no. And why is that? 
because when you added the object in the collection, your object had one set of values, so it had, it had one hash code. Then you change the properties of the objects. Now the hash code is different, so the hash function will never find your object anymore because uh, the, the hash codes are different. So that's why you should always be using immutable objects when you're using a hash set or a hash map. So this is a very good practice that should be, you should be following. Right? What else? How much time do we have? Not much. So let's see what we can use here. What did I promise to show? So I'll go to the more interesting part. So maybe I'll come back if I have more time later. So let's uh, jump and skip to, for example, um, method references. So method reference is a new addition to the book in Java 8. So uh, if you are used to using lambdas, if I want to create lambdas, I don't know how many, uh, I hope that everybody's used it uh, to la Java lambdas for now. But one special type of um, construction that we have in the language is that we can replace lambdas for method references. And most of the time, you should be doing that because method references are more readable. After you understand the syntax, they are simpler. There are very few use cases where you shouldn't be using um, method reference, but these are exceptions. So what I'm going to show you right now is that in Java 8 Plus, you have five different types of method references. And how do we create them? So the first and easiest one for you to be creating is the static method reference. For example, if I have a, here a function that creates a string to an, uh, converts a string, to an integer. So it would be, if I have a string, I can use integer.parse int, integer.parse int s, okay? So this code converts a strings to an integer. How can I do that? I can convert this lambda. In fact, most of the IDEs provide refactors for you to be doing that. This one has an additional parenthesis. Yes. Now, I can, instead of using s integer dot parse int, parse int s, I can use integer colon colon parse int, which is the simplest method reference that you can create. I'm calling a static method on the integer class, okay? So this is the simplest possible method reference that we can have. And now let's go to the most complicated one, which is the bound method reference. So bound method reference means that, well, maybe I have, I need a predicate. Uh, so I'll do this. I have an instance i. Now it's after i. Okay. So what is happening here? I have, I'm receiving an instance. I'm creating a new object. Uh, Instant.now returns for me a new instance, which is a point in time. And I'm checking on this instance that is re being returned from this method. I'm calling is after uh, and receiving this argument. Okay. So what is a bound method reference? A bound method reference means that I'm calling uh, this method. This method is returning an object, and I want the is after method to be calling on this object. Okay. How do I convert this to a method reference? Even though I know that this particular method this particular method reference is not bytecode equivalent. I can say instance dot now colon colon is after. Okay. So in whenever is the, whatever is the object that is being returned from this method, I want to call the method is after on that instance. Okay. This is a bound method reference. This is the most complicated one, and to be honest, not that common to be used. But uh, you get the point. So the most common ones are static and unbounded, which is the next one that I'm going to show. So if I want to say unbounded, unbounded, I have a unary operator. Let's say I have a string, and I want to convert that to lowercase. So this is a very common lambda that you would be using in your collection of strings. Uh, but if I want to change that, maybe I could say that, well, string, colon, colon, to lowercase. Whenever is the object that I'm receiving, I want to call to lowercase on the method that I'm uh, on the object that I'm receiving. Okay, so these are the two. These two are the most simple uh, method reference you can use. You can also, if you want to construct something, I have a constructor uh, here. I have a supplier, which means that I received nothing, and I need to create a new tree map, for example. This is a 
uh, cons uh, constructor method reference tree map column column new so this is a very na nice syntax if you just need to create a new object okay new tree map tree map column column new but as we learned it today if you want to create a factor method a static factor method we probably should be using the static uh, uh, method of reference here and the last one if I want to create a new array, so here I'm, I'm receiving an integer, which is the size of the array. So if I want new i, uh, but I could also be using a method reference saying that, well, you should be, you could be. Say int brackets colon colon new is the method reference for you to be creating a new array um, with uh, a lambda and method reference, okay? These are the five different types of method reference, and you need to get used to this syntax because it's a syntax that uh, most of the times, I think you might agree with me, it's more readable for you to be using the method reference than using the lambda. Okay. So this is the basic uh, recommendation. Okay. So you said 830? 830 should be fine. Okay, so let's see what I can show you right now so if I have here uh, the method reference let's try to just show you a very quick slide here uh, we can also have function interfaces in Java 8 which are in function function interfaces are interfaces that I can use in a lambda and now that we have function interfaces we should be favoring the strategy design pattern over the template method design pattern and how does it work so and how many function interfaces we have on the JDK? First, I have to show you what is a function interface. So if I want to create a new my functional interface, which is interface that can be used in the Java yeah, lambdas, I can interface public. It's a very stupid interface because it receives no argument and returns nothing. So you should be provide, creating better APIs for your code, okay? But if you're creating a function interface, you could, sh should always be adding the at add functional interface annotation. And why is that? Because, you know, maybe you're a library developer or you're, cr you're creating a class that will be reused by other developers. You know that you designed this interface as a function interface. So uh, a function interface should only have one uh, abstract methods, uh, uh, one known, uh, yeah, one abstract methods. But if you omit this interface later, someone de somebody decides to maintain your code, and well, maybe it could be adding another methods on this interface. And since you're developing a library, for example, your code compiles pretty well. But every, but now that when you release this new version and people using your library update their code, their code doesn't compile anymore because they were using your function interface in Java lambdas and now they are not allowed to do that anymore. So you should be always be adding at, f at function interface. If you intend your, uh, your uh, intent to have your interface as a function interface, because when you add this annotation, if you try to add int, uh, when you add another method, your code breaks because it doesn't compile anymore, which is a good way for you to prevent some sorts of bug, okay? But before creating your own function interfaces, you should be aware that it's a very bad idea most of the times. Uh, you already had, last time I counted on the JDK, you had 39 different function interface for you to learn. And 39, maybe it's a number big enough for you to already learn. So if you want to learn Java and use lambdas, lambdas property, you need to learn 39 basic Java functional interfaces. And when you're creating another one, is another function interface for your fellow developers to be learning. It's much more coverage. You need to provide your own test case for that. So usually, uh, creating your own functional interface should be the exceptions, uh, exception. Most of the time, you should be reusing one of the JDK functional interfaces. But you don't have to remember all the 39 ones. You just need to remember the six ones. Because most of enough, all of the other variants are just the primitive type variants. So you have unary operator. Then you have int unary operator. You have long unary operator. You have double unary operator. 
and so on is because because performance uh, because um, uh, Java boxing and unboxing is very expensive so the JDK maintainers provided primitive versions of each one of these interfaces on how do they work uh, these are the ones that you need to remember unary operator is something that uh, uh, receives one argument of type T and returns the same type okay so if you receive a string you are also returning a string so that's a unary operator a binary operator receives two arguments of the same type and returns the same time too so if I have a string I receive two strings and I return a string too okay it's always the same type if I have a predicate, a predicate is something that receives an, an argument of type T and returns true or false. A function is something that receives an argument of type T and returns a type of type R, which usually functions are used to convert one object into another one. For example, if I would want to convert a, an integer to string, I uh, will use a function that receives an integer and returns a string. A supplier is something that receives nothing, has no arguments, and creates a new object for me. And a consumer is something that, well, receives an argument of type T and returns void. It just consumes the argument that is being received. These are the six basic functional interfaces that we have in the JDK. And learn that, you've learned all, almost all of the 39 variants that are available on the JDK. And from my experience, this one covers uh, at least from, uh, from my experience so far, 100% of the cases where you want to use a functional interface. So you create your methods, you'll be using these ones. Okay. And so I still have some minutes, so let's try to use a very nice demo. So I said enums are my favorite construct in the Java world, so what can we do? I can create like uh, operation. And let's create that as in enum. So the way for you to be creating polymorphic enums in the past until Java 7 was uh, this way. So if I wanted to create like an add, subtract, subtract, multiply, and divide the enums. And if I want them to be polymorphic, I would sh should be using like public abstract int uh, apply x and y so they're abstract so it's complaining because it doesn't compile because in each one of them I should be providing my own implementation apply return x plus y and here in subtract Oops. apply return x minus y multiply Right? This is, was a very nice way. Uh, the moment I read this on the book, I said, oh, this is a very nice way for you to provide polymorphic operations on the Java language using enums. Okay? But, oh, and another uh, tip that I can give you with enums if you really want to create a singleton, singleton, the best way for you to be creating a singleton is creating an instance with enums. And why should you be using that? This is the best way for you to guarantee that you will only have a single instance of your object in runtime because or else you need to be implementing your own serialization proxies okay because the problem with oh, oh but I used to implement like class my singleton then I used to private static final my singleton singleton okay maybe you were using this way and you needed a private constructor too private my singleton uh, to be truly a singleton this is the way that people thought would be the best way to implement a singleton the problem is that if you use serialization this one is not safe you might have multiple copies of your singleton in memory if you want to provide a very easy implementation very cheap one public enum singleton this is the instance and remember Java enums are full featured Java classes with limited instantiability. Uh, to my knowledge, Java is the only language that provides such a construct. In fact, if you show this to a C-sharp developer, 
he or she will be simply amazed because in C sharp enums are just constants, and but in Java enums are full future Java classes with uh, well as I said limited instantiability, which is a very nice thing to have. But back to my operation, this is the Java 7 version of providing polymorphic enums. If I wanted to have in Java 8, uh, instead of pro using what are we doing here, we're implementing this strategy uh, uh, pattern uh, using uh, overriding the implementation. What can we do now is instead of using, using uh, the strategy pattern? Well, we'll be implementing that in a different way. I uh, will be providing an int binary operator. And I'll be providing a constructor. So now, instead of overriding in every single operation, I'm just going to provide the operation here on the constructor. So if I receive an x and y, x plus y. And if I use to uh, subtract, I can receive x and y, x minus y. If I wanted to multiply x and y, x times, and the last one is divide, divide can be x and y, x and y. Okay, this is the, what is it going to be? Oh, yeah. And now it's complaining because, well, because abstract is still, uh, uh, applies to abstract. It sh doesn't need to be abstract. Now that I have the operator, I can re just return. Return operator dot apply as int x and y. So this is the Java 8 way of providing polymorphic enums. Instead of overriding them, I just provide, uh, for example, here, an int binary operator and provide them on the constructor. And you might be complaining, oh, you're just doing this because the operations that you're using are very simple, can be implemented in one line. But suppose, for example, that the add operation where it was a very big one, which required like 10 or 15 or 20 lines of code. Uh, how could I be using this uh, here? Well, now that we have method reference and lambdas, we can do that. So suppose that addition could be implemented in another class. Apply int x int y it needs to be static so suppose that I had like a very complex operation that required many different lines of code and in the end I would return x plus y you see this method is very big and it wouldn't fit there in my in my lambda here on the class but instead of providing here I could just use a method reference so I could say with add addition apply and my code still compiles so even if you want to polymorphic it doesn't fit here well you create another class I said here uh, here I created another public class it doesn't even even need to be public it could be package private so nobody will, would know that this class existed there doesn't need to be public too so your code still compiles and it's much better uh, uh, separated so that's another way for you to be using your code and the last tip that I want to give to you is that in the past we used to implement what we call my template, template operation. Abstract. So if I had a public void do something. And if this something had an operation, I would say, well, uh, if I wanted to do something before, something later I needed to public string uh, do other thing and then abstract which means that between them I could uh, do other thing so this is a template method uh, implementation because I had some operations that I always need to do perform these steps before and I always need to perform this step later but the, the, this thing varied between my implementations so what did I had to do I had to create a class class one template x 
extends my template op my 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 template operation. So I would say do other thing. Could be returning C, and I could do the other thing, which would be returning D. I would have many different implementations. This thing would always be the same, and this thing, would, this part would be different. Now with Java 8, we're not using template methods anymore. We have a better solution for this kind of, of problem. So instead of using the template method design pattern, we are favoring the strategy design pattern. And how do we do that? So let's try to create a copy. So now it's my strategy. So instead of of doing this, now what I'm doing, instead of calling a template method, I'm receiving simply uh, a supplier string. And I get what the supplier get. And I create a constructor which receives one. I, for example, refactor these two refactor methods. Refactor, factor methods. Worse. Oh, not working. Uh, but I can always private public my strategy operation strategy strategy operation of oh yeah thank you public you should have provided me a warning somewhere right and I can check if it's not no, for example, supplier, which is a nod method from Guava, for example. And now that I'm doing this, I, if I want to implement, I don't need to subclass anymore. I can provide it with a lambda. I can say, well, maybe you can use my strategy operation off and provide, well, here you return C. Don't do something. And here, you can do that using D, for example. And if I decide to run this thing, you can see that you have a lot of A's and C, and here in the bottom you have a D in the middle. So this is the way that you should be using your code strategy over strategy using lambdas instead of using uh, the template operation. And I know that everybody's hungry. My, I'm hungry too. My belly is making noises. And that's what I wanted to show you for this first session, which is the longest one. And thank you very much.